As you were listening to the scripture, you may have noticed reference to the devil, repeated use of the word evil, in case you missed it. Here are those verses again. Put on the whole armor of God so you can stand against the wiles of the devil, that you may withstand on the evil day. For our struggle is against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You will be able to quench the flaming arrows of the evil one. In this congregation, these are terms that are not highly emphasized. They evoke a variety of images and understandings. From a biblical view, we might distinguish between the devil, Satan, Hasatan, whether these are the same things, as well as how they are connected to this idea of evil. So I turn it back to you. When you hear the word evil, what are some images or words that come to mind? Can't say them in the sanctuary. Can't say them in the sanctuary. Wow, we should talk later. <laughs> Others. What come? Violence. 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 Any? Wars. Wars. Terror. Genocide. Terror. Terror. Genocide. The devil. The devil. Lies. Mars. Lies. Lies. So if you think of the devil as the personification of evil, maybe you have an image of red skin and horns and a tail pitchfork, maybe cloven hooves. Maybe you have an image of someone that looks human, but with something that's a little off. By extension, these symbols that are used to talk about devil or evil also get attached to people or groups to demonize them to call them enemies, suggesting that they are not just opposed to one group, but are somehow an embodiment of evil. Look at this propaganda poster. The NAB Research Center, a humanities research laboratory at Salisbury University, says about this Russian poster, the enemy of humankind depicts Kaiser Wilhelm II, the last German emperor and king of Prussia, who was largely blamed for World War I as a devil with cloven hooves holding human skulls. Some years ago, I visited Yad Vashem Holocaust Museum in Israel, and I've also seen, been to the Holocaust Museum in DC. And you can see a number of posters and artifacts like that linking the devil to, to Jewish people in words and images. Unless we think that we've moved beyond those tropes, a quick Google search reveals that they are still used today for one group to objectify and demonize another. Whether it's based on the realities of religion, ideology, political affiliation, culture, race, sexual orientation, or any other form of identity. By multiple de definitions, enemies are those who wish to do harm to us. And as people, we have long used this idea of evil as a way of describing enemies or those we see as different from us in terms of appearance, or in belief. This characterization leads to an idea that it's not only acceptable, but a holy duty to vanquish what we have deemed to be evil. Now what you all have named, mostly, almost entirely, are not people, are not images, but ideologies. 
So the scripture for today, the scripture for today has been used to justify a kind of crusade against evil forces. Ephesians, as you heard, says to put on the full armor of God, to stand against the wiles of the devil. The descriptions of the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and especially the sword of the spirit give an image that we should be ready to do battle against an enemy that is beyond flesh and blood and has cosmic significance. As is often illustrated, to stand firm takes on the steadfastness of a soldier with a single-minded focus and a courage that has no room for doubt, hesitation, or fear. I don't know about you, although I suspect, but the words and images are hard for me to reconcile with a life of nonviolence. Even the description of the shoes ready to proclaim the gospel of peace seem out of place with imagery that is combined with tools and weapons used in battle. It helps a little that with the exception of the sword of the spirit, all the armor is for defense instead of offense. The the sword itself is the word of God, and, and that word is about life, not death, and light that shines in the darkness, not slicing its way through obstacles on its path to victory. But we are challenged, especially with images like this and words of scripture, to consider how we engage in this scripture and the realities around us in ways that are true to our faith and that honor our call to walk with Christ who told crowds to love their enemies and said that those who live by the sword will die by the sword. The Ephesian scripture is clear that enemies are not flesh and blood, but it still promotes an idea that a battle is taking place. It isn't waged against people, but forces in a time of darkness that is upon us. C.S. Lewis built on this idea in the screw tape letters. And Frank Peretti explored these verses in the novel, This Present Darkness. It's listed as a Christian novel, but you could also have it defined under categories of suspense, horror, and fantasy. I first came across it when I was in high school and I recognized the scriptural reference of this present darkness, but the storyline of angelic forces doing battle with demonic forces and the ways that they influence people in positive and negative ways went far beyond scripture. From both literary and theological perspectives, the writing saw the world in stark contrasts of good and evil. From the book's perspective, weak people are influenced by demonic forces, and strong people, at least strong in faith, are influenced by angelic forces, and they become heroes. Neither the novel nor its sequel have much indication or possibility that people are more complex than either or, or that we might be combinations of a variety of motives. While giving room for free will, God through angels is doing battle for people to be saved from destruction from a faith perspective. I question then and now this understanding that God uses the tactics of war to bring life and peace. As we continue to explore the principles of Kingian nonviolence, remember where we've been because they build on each other. Here are the first two principles again. Nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. And two, the beloved community is the framework for the future. And today, attack forces of evil, not persons doing evil. 
training materials that we had for those who were part of the 16-hour the training include the nonviolence approach helps one analyze the fundamental conditions, policies, and practices of the conflict rather than reacting to one's opponents or their personalities. The connection to the Ephesians scripture, especially verse 12, seems obvious. King framed his response to those who opposed civil rights as persons whose actions were evil, but who were nonetheless made in God's image. His commitment to nonviolence and agape love were so strong that he refused to use violent words or actions to denigrate them, even when it harmed him. When he was struck or jailed, he didn't strike back or fight to gain freedom. And in his sermons and writings, he consistently called for people to address the evils of racism and other injustices without resorting to words of hatred for people. In the Kingian nonviolence training, righteous indignation is directed at conditions instead of at people. Actions address the evils of isms that you all have named, that tear apart God's beloved community instead of dividing people into camps of the righteous and the unrighteous. In addition to calling us to courageous love, this approach opens us to the reality that we each have the capacity to do good or harm, to be saints and sinners. It's not for us to judge the hearts of people, but to seek a way of being that enhances a just life for all. One of the pieces that struck me as most powerful in the training was this assertion that these principles that we are studying are not secrets or weapons that are used to defeat an enemy. Not only can they be used by anyone, the ultimate desires that they would be used by everyone. In fact, many of these strategies have been used by a variety of groups. But the difference is the practitioners of these principles keep before them a constant hope of bringing in those who might be considered enemies. I was talking to a youth the other day about enemies and how he would define them. His response was that enemies are people who want something different from you. I thought it was an interesting definition, one that moves away from seeing enemies as evil or necessarily wrong. In this season, we encounter, directly or through social media, many people who might want something different from those with whom you are in contact. By this definition, they could be considered enemies, but it doesn't make them people to hate or to destroy. It could open us to see someone as an enemy on one issue and an ally on another. It could even make us see that we might have the same goals with different ways of getting there. With that definition, one approach to resolving or working through conflict is not through attacking or demonizing or dehumanizing, but instead through listening. Imagine if our political discourse looked and sounded more like that. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote in Strength to Love, Why should we love our enemies? The fair, first reason's fairly obvious. Returning hate for hate multiplies hate, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Hate multiplies hate. Violence multiplies violence. Toughness multiplies toughness in a descending cycle, spiral of destruction. The chain reaction of evil 
hate begetting hate, wars producing more wars must be broken or we shall be plunged into the dark abyss of annihilation. Seeing people as evil blinds us to God's call in our lives and the ways that we are called to follow Jesus. In John's gospel, as Jesus was sharing a final meal with the disciples, the narrative says the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. John's gospel doesn't have a story of Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. But Judas here is portrayed as being influenced by evil. And even so, John washed, Jesus washed his feet. Did not call him out for violence, did not curse him, did not do this for anyone who came to arrest him. In fact, he said, do not take up arms on my behalf. His way of dealing with evil forces was to love, to not deny injustice, but to stand with those who were vulnerable and to extend a desire for others to turn toward goodness. We are called to do the same. The Ephesians text mentions evil three times, but it includes stand or withstand four times. In the face of injustice, we are challenged to stand firm, not in a posture of battling enemies, but with an assurance of God's calling to each one of us. We don't just stand as individuals, but as the beloved community, gathered around the light that is Christ. Our armor is not to do battle against forces we cannot see, but to live in the hope and belief of light and hope that overcomes darkness and hatred. As we stand, we use our actions and our words to bring goodness into creation. It means believing that our lives have meaning and that when we stand, we find courage to face challenges before us. And they are there. Sometimes it means standing at a safe distance to avoid for further harm. And sometimes it means sitting at a common table to talk through our differences. We stand firm because we have a community that stands with us as we seek the light of God to lead us. King and other leaders were able to stand up to the evils of racism with the support of a community that prayed, that encourages, that held fast to this conviction that all are included in God's care and concern. And so when faced with fire hoses and attack dogs, as well as the taunts and violence of those who opposed them, those who stood up in the name of love could speak actions of evil while continuing to dream of a day when all people could stand together. That comes with faith in something that is beyond ourselves. We live it today in our continued advocacy and concern and struggle for racial and gender and sexual orientation, accessibility, climate justice. We stand firm in faith that God envelops us and equips us for struggles against systems that oppress. And sometimes that means humility in thinking about how we have contributed to those systems ourselves. It begins in the ways that we speak blessings for the innocent and the vulnerable and for the ways that we avoid the us and them language. In the church, the brethren, we don't do baby and baby baptisms with the idea of a salvation, but we do baby and child dedications with a blessing and a community of support. 
It is a way of standing with a family, with a shared promise that no matter what they may experience, God is with them. And so is the congregation. As children grow in the congregation, as others join as youth or as adults, we continue to expand this circle, not only looking inward, but looking beyond to include those who might be willing to join. In fighting forces of evil, we seek to destroy enemies, not with weapons, but instead by committing ourselves to seeing them as God's desire for a beloved community, to refuse to see enemies not as objects, but as our kindred. We share the truth we have learned together in Christ's light and love, and with courage, we stand firm in the foundation of life we have through Christ Jesus. May it be so. I am sure that I am not the only one present today who can remember 1968. That was a very interesting year for our country. In January of that year, the Tet Offensive was launched by the North Vietnamese, creating a turning point in an unpopular war. In March, The My Lai Massacre took place in South Vietnam, a horrible stain on the American military. On April the 4th, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. And as you know, we are studying his principles of nonviolence. On January 5th, Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated. And throughout that year, protests against the war in Vietnam became increasingly common and, at times, violent. Not everything in 1968 was bad, however. (laughs) For example, on May the 13th, I was baptized into the Church of the Brethren to begin my journey as a member of the church. And I still remember Christmas Eve of 1968, when my family was watching on television in preparation for the candlelight service at the Ephra Church of the Brethren, and we watched with amazement as the Apollo 8 astronauts became the first humans to circle the moon, sending breathtaking images back to the earth. All of this is to say that change is a constant thing. Some changes are negative, some are positive, and sometimes it might depend on how we react to it. Our congregation has gone through many changes over the years. One of the more recent changes involves the use of technology to extend our ministry beyond these physical walls to include a sizable online congregation. My wife and I worship weekly with this church, but most of the time we do so online. This technology has enabled our congregation to become interstate, but also international. Online worshipers are encouraged to sign in, just like those who are in this room. And they also have the opportunity to financially support the ministry and the mission of the Elizabethtown Church of the Brethren. So, whether we are present in this room 
or present in our cyber room, we are encouraged to join as one body in support of the ministry and the mission of the Elizabethtown Church of the Brethren. As you leave this place, stand firm in faith. Hold one another in prayer. Gather in community. Walk in the light of love that guards and guides and reveals God's presence everywhere. Go in peace. <laughs>